Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the Meredith Chapman murder case. This case involves a love triangle in which Chapman was murdered by an affair partner's wife. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I've made a supplemental to this video that I have put on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, I'll move to the timeline of the crime, and then offer my analysis. This murder occurred in 2018 in Radnor Township, Pennsylvania, and primarily involved three individuals, 48-year-old Mark Garrido, his wife, 47-year-old Janair Garrido, and a 33-year-old woman named Meredith Chapman. Mark and Janair had met in 1986 in Indiana, but they wouldn't start dating until four years later. Mark was attracted to Janair because she was so direct, unlike him. They would get married in 1993 when he was 25 and she was 23. There were some difficulties in the relationship. They had arguments Mark described as epic. He said that Janair would win the arguments because she was always going to have the last word. They moved to South Carolina and both started working in marketing, but then Janair lost her job and could not find a new one. Mark applied for a job at the University of Delaware, a position that reported to Meredith Chapman. Mark was concerned about being managed by somebody 15 years younger, but when he sat with her, he found her to be energetic, articulate, and passionate. He was offered the job and moved to Delaware in November of 2017. Janair stayed behind to arrange for their house to be leased. Mark and Meredith started becoming friendly at work, Meredith encouraged Mark. She said a number of kind words to him. For example, she told him he was a wonderful man, he was good at what he did, and he was amazing. Mark claimed that his wife never said things like that about him. Eventually, Meredith asked Mark out for a drink. Mark talked about his marriage in not necessarily a negative way, which doesn't sound like the same thing as a positive way. He claimed that the issues with his marriage came into focus when he was with Meredith. She also told him about how she was unhappy in her marriage of nine years. Mark and Meredith kissed. Mark immediately felt awful. He resisted the pull of romance, but then he realized he just couldn't give up the feelings he was having for Meredith. The two continued to have an affair and were making plans for a future together. In December of 2017, Janair moved to be with Mark in Delaware. Immediately she could tell that something was off, Mark was distant, she confronted him, she had a suspicion about Meredith because Mark talked about her. Mark denied having an affair, but admitted it on February 14, 2018, Valentine's Day, putting a new twist on the idea of a hopeless romantic. After this, Janair engaged a number of activities. She posted messages on the website next door, saying, I was just transferred from Delaware for my husband's new job and he's telling me he wants a divorce. She was looking for an excellent marriage counselor for a couple on the brink of divorce, specifically a counselor who is very educated and has experience with issues of infidelity, depression, traumatic experiences, child parent dynamics, and being accountable for actions. Janair planted listening devices in Mark's jackets. She actually had to sew them into the fabric she had software that allowed her to gain access to Mark's phone. She planted GPS tracking devices on the vehicles of both Meredith and Mark. She bought a lock picking kit, software to hack computers, and a DNA testing kit. She also purchased a Taurus Tracker 357 Magnum revolver. This particular revolver holds seven rounds. She told a divorce coach that she was furious that Mark was leaving her for a younger woman. She felt as though she was being tossed away or traded in. She spied on Meredith using a pair of binoculars. While all this was going on, Mark agreed to go to marriage counseling, but on the day of their second session, he found one of those listing devices in his jacket. Janair said that she wanted to know what Mark and Meredith were planning. Mark said that he was planning on filing for divorce in May. Meredith took a job at Villanova University and was planning to leave her husband. On April 23, 2018, Janair made her way from her home in Delaware to Radnor, Pennsylvania, to the home of Meredith Chapman. She was wearing a wig 
and carrying her revolver. She was supposed to be meeting Mark that evening. He was at the restaurant waiting for her. First, she said she was running late. Then she told him to go home. Shortly after this, she sent him a picture of what appeared to be Meredith's trash, including a condom that had belonged to Mark. She sent Mark a few text messages. She said, you ruined my life. I hope you never find happiness. And bye, Mark. She broke into Meredith's residence. She cleaned up the broken glass so that Meredith wouldn't realize that anything was amiss. At about 7 p.m., Meredith arrived at her house and entered, only to be shot to death in the kitchen by Janair, who in turn brought an end to her own life with the same weapon. Mark drove to Meredith's house. He walked around the house and was able to see Meredith on the floor, not moving. Apparently, he became somewhat hysterical. A neighbor called the police. Initially, the police thought that Mark was a good suspect. He was rude and yelling at them, and they couldn't find a firearm. Soon after this, they realized that the tourist tracker was underneath Janair's body, and they determined that Janair was responsible for the homicide. Now moving to my analysis. According to Mark, Janair suffered from depression and not long before the homicide was diagnosed with PTSD due to the trauma of her marriage ending. After the murder, Mark moved away and said he started drinking heavily. He eventually ended up in San Diego, California. He wrote a book about the crime and has been interviewed a few times, but he said he is not out for fame or fortune. He has talked about this 15-page letter that was allegedly written by Janair. I don't think it's ever been made public. Mark said that he gave it to a mental health professional to read. That mental health professional claimed that all nine symptoms of borderline personality disorder are evident in the letter, going so far as to say she must have had severe BPD. I have a few problems with this. One, how would a mental health professional know that the letter was really written by Janair, or if it was written by her, how do they know it wasn't modified? Two, it's impossible to figure out somebody's diagnosis without meeting them. Even if the letter said, here are the nine symptoms for BPD, I have all of them, that is still not enough. You really have to sit with the person. If there was an alignment between the content of the letter and borderline, the professional could have said something like, she may have had BPD. Three, BPD is a pervasive pattern that usually starts in one's adolescence. Was there a history going back that early? So we're supposed to believe this letter was like her whole life story. What about the stress that Janair was under at that time? The stress of having her life shattered could cause symptoms that look like BPD. It seems like a lot of the information we have about Janair actually comes from Mark, so understandably, it should be interpreted with a degree of skepticism. I think it's reasonable to believe that Janair had some mental health symptoms. Even under the stress of an affair, most people would not become homicidal. The stalking behavior is not unusual under the circumstances, but the degree to which she engaged in that activity was. Like the electronic surveillance and all that, it's a little over the top. It was like she turned into James Bond. She really went all out to find out every detail. Janair specifically mentioned depression in that posting I mentioned before when she was looking for a counselor. She may have been talking about her own depression there. Maybe she was wondering if it contributed to the failure of her marriage. So maybe she started to blame herself in all this. Here are a few things that stand out to me in this case. Number one, Janair was overwhelmed by Mark's affair. It turned her world upside down. She had a variety of emotions and ideas. The ideas ranged from trying to fix the marriage to homicide. So I guess it's safe to say that she wasn't ruling anything out. Flexibility is good, but there is such a thing as having too wide a range of options. It was like she was scrambling until she became set on revenge. When she accepted that she was going to bring an end to her own life, the number of options she had available increased, and her mood seemed closer to normal from Mark's perspective, so she was acting calm and stable. This acceptance about her death was the gateway to homicide. There was nothing to lose. Number two, Mark reportedly had a different goal for therapy than Janair had. I don't know what the goal was, but it would be reasonable to believe that he was looking to build a relationship with Meredith, and Janair was looking to fix the marriage. I've seen this many times. The course of infidelity is so predictable and obvious, except to those involved in it. Everybody in this situation was trapped in a fantasy. Janair believed that her marriage could be saved, at least initially. 
Mark believed that he would be able to simply replace Janair, and he would be happy. Meredith essentially believed the same thing as Mark. Number three, this story connects with a familiar scenario. A husband and wife are between 45 and 65. The husband believes the wife is not as attractive as she used to be. The relationship is stale, not exciting. He finds a younger woman who's more attractive and who pays him compliments. He can't resist this newfound magical love that will transform his life into what he always imagined it could be. The younger woman is amazed at how sensitive and caring the older man is. She wants maturity, and she believes he has it, even though his involvement with her indicates that maturity may not be his strong suit. The wife is left out of the picture. She is taken by surprise. All this happens, and she's left to pick up the pieces. She's the only one left without a plan, the only one who is alone, even though the plan that the other two have built will almost certainly end in disaster. In reality, the life feeling left out is like somebody regretting that they couldn't get into the 1966 Thunderbird convertible with Thelma and Louise as they drove toward the Grand Canyon. Sometimes it's better to be left out of a plan. Although, of course, that's not how it seems in a situation like this. There is a real sense that being alone is bad. Number four, Mark mentioned that there was a plan B in that mysterious 15-page letter, which was that Janair was going to kill him if he entered the house first. She may have written that, but Mark's suffering was her plan. That was the only way she could truly get revenge. Killing him would not be satisfactory from her point of view. She could have easily waited for Mark to arrive and shot him if that's what she wanted to do. Number five, there is a danger in knowing the details. When people are the victims of infidelity, they always want to know the details about the sex and all the lovey-dovey conversations. Those details are pernicious. They will never bring peace calm, or reason. Janair made her situation worse by taking in all that information. It increased her sense of intrasexual competition and led to aggression. This case exemplifies many of the classic mistakes that are made when people are involved in affairs, and some unusual ones like the homicide part. A marriage or other committed relationship needs to be resolved without external romantic influence and without predetermined solutions. If somebody wants to leave a relationship, they can do that. But starting another one first complicates the matter. If a couple wants to go to counseling, it's important to allow the exploration of values, feelings, goals, and concerns, rather than to be fixated on a particular outcome that is desired, like continuing an affair or saving a marriage. The couple needs to be open to what the counselor can help them discover in the course of those sessions. Those are my thoughts on the Meredith Chapman murder. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.